able to get it pretty quickly. So that's how I check column integrity. So rather than having to compare manually, you can just do it and run it again and again so there won't be any thought to it. So then for data uh, and referential integrity, for referential integrity, I basically do a count on uh, the foreign key column. That's referring to a primary key column, right? So uh, the constraints of a foreign key are that the foreign key cannot could uh, must uh, point to a primary key whenever it exists, right? You can have a entry in a you, you could have a foreign key column uh, row with entry of null, but every time there exists a foreign key, it must uh, it must uh, point to a primary key. So in my human resources uh, dot employee uh, uh, table, I did a count. Right, and I found out the amount of uh, foreign keys in that table, and uh, I did a join with uh, the contact table, which has a primary key called contact ID. So I joined the I joined the human resources dot employee uh, table with the contact uh, table on the column contact ID, and uh, if they return the same values, that means referential integrity has been uh, kept and the foreign keys uh, functioning as it should. If it does not return the same values for both queries, that means uh, referential integrity is not being unheld. So let me show you that in action. So I have these two queries right here. I'm going to run them together. Right? So I ran them. So here are the results. The first query returned 290, and the second query returned 290. Uh, that means referential integrity has been properly maintained. Um, if you don't understand that, look at the code. I, un I, I believe um, I mentioned at the beginning that I expect you to know at least uh, have broad understanding of SQL, and then you'll get a you'll, you'll you should be able to understand it after a little bit of thought. Okay, so for derived and calculated values, uh, I think it's pretty uh, self-explanatory. You would just uh, uh, check whether the concatenations occur correctly. You will check the operations. You will check the is null conditions for each and every row. You can do this by using a temporary table and uh, copying the mapping there, or you could uh, simply make another derived column and compare it, the two columns, the derived column and the derived column you created, to see if the the values are loaded correctly. And you could do the same with the calculated co uh, value column. Um, so uh, normally these uh, columns entail like. Uh, have something to do with either operations or concatenations with uh, or it might be a simple loading a timestamp right that would be a derived column because it, uh, so it will be on the fly so uh, those are some simple tests um, in order to test the triggers and uh, constraint conditions you could uh, basically you could do a use case you can be like you could test different cases if you try to insert this and the condition is wrong Right, because business rules are implemented through tri in databases through tr the use of triggers and constraint conditions. Right, so basically you just test those conditions on the database and see whether it worked correctly. Uh, if it didn't, it fail. You fail it. If it works, you pass it. It's as simple as that. And then for testing the ETL, I've seen two approaches for doing this. Right, you because when you're testing the ETL, number one, you got to make sure all the values are there. Because like I said. Uh, information is money, so you don't want to lose any records, right? And number two, you have to uh, make sure that the transformation is correct, because I have I have seen situations in which uh, the transformation has been implemented incorrectly, so then throws all the values off, right? Uh, so you got to create a temporary. Uh, so what you can do is that you could even create your own temporary table, right? You create your own temporary table in SQL Server. You will recreate the ETL for that temporary table on your own, and then you'll dump all the values from your uh, um, your source database into that table. And then with that table, you will compare it against um, the table that's already been loaded uh, through that ETL. And if the tables match, that means uh, that means it's good. If they don't match, you know something is going on. Or another thing I have done in the past. This is a little bit more complex, and uh, it'll take a little bit more thought. You could use joins to find out where the, and you could implement and and where conditions, 
and you could implement and you could just follow the transformation so you could say this source column is supposed to end up in this destination column correct so um, you will only have the source and destination uh, uh, rows uh, shown uh, in your query uh, because you're doing a join between two tables and two different databases right the source database and the destination database and then you check for the values in the source and destinations that don't match up so when they don't match up uh, you know that there is a problem and when they do match up right you know that they're uh, when they do match up, there's no problem. When they don't match up and follow the conditions as specified in your mapping document and your test case, you know something's wrong. So you could either use temporary tables or you could implement it using join and where clauses. And then for incremental loads. Incremental loads are often done in the next phase of te testing after your basic testing. And uh, so basically what you have to do is test the values before see if it's all working correctly after implemental load occurs you test uh, whether the timestamps have changed right uh, often you use load underscore TS uh, or uh, and um, uh, last UPD underscore TS that's another uh, common column used uh, uh, read up on incremental loads if you don't know them because most companies should use them right because it saves on network traffic and uh, speeds up uh, updates and uh, Basically, you're testing whether records properly get updated and they don't have duplicates and uh, uh, things along that line. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce you briefly to Quality Center. Quality Center, uh, made by HP, is a tool used to track uh, bugs and test cases. A lot of big companies use it. Um, so basically in test center you would go to your test plan you would create a, uh, and then you would uh, create folders accordingly and then within a folder of your choice the folders would determine what project it's in based on uh, however your manager uh, uh, decided to set things up and you would create individual test cases um, in the test cases, you would add a description as shown on the screen. This is actually HP. Um, and then you would uh, put a summary, you would describe it, you would uh, say what it's supposed to do. You, basically, when describing the test case, you give as many details as possible and leave as little to the person reading its imagination as possible. This will help uh, you along, right? Next, you would click on uh, uh, design steps and you describe the, the steps in the particular test case and the expected results. That's the first part. And you would add your test cases for every single scenario in that folder or uh, wherever they specify it as possible. This would go under test plan. That's the first step when you're adding uh, test cases to, a, to HP Quality Center. Next, you go to your test lab. In your test lab, you go to... Uh, select tests uh, and you click on that tab and then you'll get a column uh, that would appear it's not shown in this diagram but you get a column on the right hand side of the screen the right hand side of the screen would basically be all the folders and how it's uh, set up in your uh, test plan uh, tab right uh, so uh, based on that you would uh, drag and drop you would first create a test set on your uh, solution explorer on the left side of the screen and then based on the in the folder as your manager asks you to and then you would uh, uh, click on that test set you would uh, click on select test you select it from your uh, test plan uh, tab on the right hand side of the screen which would appear which would be a bunch of folders also drag and drop it and then you would pass or fail it uh, each of the tests that would show up under uh, plan underscore or test name uh, column in your execution grid and uh, um, that would be the second step, right? Uh, so based on basically right here, you're saying how many tests passed or how many tests failed. And you would also, uh, so this is basically telling you, this is basically where you test things out and see whether it really works or not after you've written all your test cases. And then the most important tab 
this is where well te they often take r reports from test lab because HP has a back-end uh, uh, database and I've seen people use SSRS to uh, make uh, or uh, or crystal reports to create uh, reports off this so that uh, upper level management can see what's going on with that program and or software release and uh, what they're thinking about it and then you'll have defects the defects I wish I could show this to you in more detail basically you would go to new defect you'd create it you would uh, write your uh, summary and I like the summary to be as descriptive as possible so you would have the summary information uh, like uh, I'll show you how to put write a proper summary in the next uh, slide however uh, in this in, when you're creating a new defect you write as much about it as possible right so uh, I'll also uh, show you about that in the next slide so uh, you'd say and you would also so as you can see there's a defect tab I'm gonna be pretty vague on this but realize that this tab is where you go to create new defects and uh, the developer will then look at it and uh, uh, know what to fix in their software program okay so for defect logging suggestions I suggest the number one I'm actually talking about how you should write a summary so uh, the first part you should write the test case ID so that's just the number a descriptive uh, number of that particular test case and then you write a dash and then write the table name that the defect has been found in. Then you write a dot and then you write the column name. Uh, this will tell them exactly where to find out uh, that particular problem. And then you use another dash and describe the problem in detail. In the details of that test case, you write as much as possible. This is uh, uh, so they won't get confused and they're not going to come back to you and ask questions because that's the worst time waster people asking you questions. If they understand just by reading your work, that's fine because you're only going to answer it once and you're never going to have to go back to it. If they don't understand it and other defects related to that, they're going to come back again and again and again. So by doing this properly the first time, you're going to have less work and that's always better for you, right? Because um, then you can take your vacations, you don't have to worry, you don't have to sweat. It's all on to developers and the team lead. They can stress that all they want. As long as you do your work, you're fine. So. Uh, this is a template I like to use uh, in number two. I like to write down a description of the problem. I like to write down the transformation rule, if there was a transformation rule uh, used in it. Uh, and I'll paste that there. Then I'll write the steps to reproduce. So I'll write any code I used to test it um, in that uh, steps to reproduce section. Then I'll go to expected results. I'll say what I expected to see based on the steps to reproduce and then I'll write the actual results. In the notes and references, I'll post down any, uh, for example, if your company is using Team Foundation Server, I'll write down like uh, the directory in order to find files like mapping documents or uh, um, any notes that will give them more information about this particular problem rather than having to come to me. So they can actually read that, right? And that will uh, uh, help you log that particular defect. And that is all for quality assurance. Um, I That's the end of this lecture, and I hope I gave you a good overview. However, I do want to mention that from company to company, these requirements tend to change. So you have to be as, uh, you have to be at, realize that uh, nothing's perfect. Like, the, no one's always going to write a proper mapping document. They're going to make mistakes. And not everyone's going to always make a test strategy. Not everyone's going to make a test plan. It's not going to be written in stone how they do it. However, this is a general overview of how it's done. It's always helpful to look into it. Uh, so keep an open mind. Realize that the jargon and how they call these things might change from uh, time to time. Sometimes they call, uh, for example, sometimes they call white box testing, glass texting, uh, uh, testing, right? Uh, there's some small subtilities uh, like that. But um, as long as you know the basics, it'll help you get well on your way. And... Uh, I hope that helped. If you have any questions, just ask. Okay, thanks, bye.